with many more to follow, I'm quite sure. Uh, I can't tell, but I thought there'd be more enthusiasm in the room this morning as you finally today, this morning, woke up and got to move your wise men to the manger. Yes? No? Oh, you've already packed them up and put them away until next year? Uh, traditionally, on the church calendar today is a uh, the Sunday that is celebrated, the, the day that the, the wise men finally made it to, to see Jesus. Somewhere we think a year to two years uh, later, which is what we really ought to be talking about today, uh, but we're not. Because we just talked about the birth of Jesus last week. So we're going to talk about the wise men's arrival, Pastor Wolders and I, next week as we kind of lay out vision for 2019-2020. Uh, uh, and we're going to tie that together. And so uh, if you need to go home, break out your uh, nativity sets, put the wise men out today just you know, to feel better about yourself, uh, you're welcome. And so um, just wanted to do this. So as we get going uh, in this teaching series on Jesus from before the womb to after the tomb... Uh, we pretty much spent all of December talking about Jesus before uh, the womb, that uh, he was preexistent, that he's always been, that he didn't just show up. His, his, his life, his ministry didn't begin in the womb. And, and then last week we talked about his birth, Jesus, the, the lamb from Bethlehem. And if you haven't seen that, as Jake said, you can go on our YouTube channel and you can find out and you can, can catch up. But, but today uh, I want to talk to you about uh, Jesus when he was just a... Uh, just days old, just days old. But to get into this teaching, uh, just a question for you, um, no, no show of hands, but uh, uh, have you ever been in a hurry when God wasn't? <laughs> uh, have you ever been in a hurry when God wasn't? Uh, maybe there's um, a disease that's kind of started to uh, ravage your body and your mind. And you just wish God would deal with it. I want this to be over. Uh, and God doesn't seem to be in a hurry. Maybe, maybe there's a financial need. And, and you've got a deadline. And you know when it needs to be met. And, and you're in a hurry for this situation. And, and God just hasn't moved yet. And you're in a hurry and God's not. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's in a marriage. Maybe it's with a rebellious child. Maybe uh, there's something going on and you just want, I want this to be over. I'm in a hurry to get to the other side of this. And uh, yet God doesn't seem to be in a hurry. Uh, well, what I want to do with you today is, is when you're in that kind of situation, I, I want to ask, ask two questions. What do I need to remember? And then what do I need to do? What do I need to and what do I need to do? Uh, Christmas, New Year's, this time of year, uh, can be filled with joy, it can be filled with excitement, but, but for so many of us, it's, it's also just a really dark time. It, it's a really discouraging time because, because uh, we want to, God to do something and he just has Maybe Maybe I can ask this question in another way. Again, uh, no show of hands, but sometimes when we're uh, in a hurry for God to do something, uh, th this is the better question. Uh, how many of you right now are, are walking around with something that's just hanging over your head? It's just hanging over your head. Uh, it won't go away no matter how much you try to think about something else. Uh, it's just always there, and, it, and, it's, and it's wearing you out. And, and have you ever noticed when, when, when you're in a hurry and God's not, and there's this, this thing that's hanging over your head that's constantly uh, just eating away at you, uh, you start to play the, the, the what-if game, right? What well, if this never goes away? Uh, what if this... Uh, what if this ruins our finances? Uh, what, what if this ruins our reputation? Um, what, if, what if life's just going to be different? And, and that, that what if game that just kind of bores a hole in your head becomes one of those brain splinters, this thing that's hanging over your head, and, and, it, and it's just there. It, it leads to fear. And, and fear, have you ever noticed that, that fear just results in you running from something that's never really been chasing you anyway? This is just for free today. This isn't really part of the teaching. This is for free today. As someone created in the image of God, you need to understand that the only thing that is chasing you, the only thing that is pursuing you, Jesus. 
one of the greatest songs that was ever written. We call it Psalm 23, Psalm 23. Maybe it's a psalm that you've heard at every funeral. It's a song that you've heard over and over again. But remember how it ends? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Better translated, uh, goodness and mercy are hunting me down. They're pursuing me. And, and when you're in a hurry and God's not, and you're playing the what-if game, and it leads to all kinds of fear, and, and fear's got you on the run, and it's never really been chasing you anything. The only thing that is chasing you today, my friend, is the mercy and the goodness and the love and the grace of God. And it came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I've walked around for years with stuff hanging over my head. Stuff that will never go away. Many of you know, some of you who are new to Miami Valley Church don't know, um, I live in chronic pain. Um, and it never goes away, and it escalates, and there's, there's no rhyme or reason, but there's, it's oftentimes like a roller coaster ride. It, it's okay, and it's a slow climb uphill, and then all of a sudden the pain hits, and you're just, uh, you have no control over it, and it just, you just live with this chronic pain, and I've, I've begged God, God, would you take this away, and I start playing the what-if game. What if this never goes away? Uh, what if this impacts my ability to, to be your pastor? What if that then ruins our finances and fear just comes chasing me? And God says, you're running from something that never was chasing you to start with. The only thing that's chasing you is my goodness and my mercy. And so uh, I just want you to do this. Um, what do you need to remember? What do you need to do when that thing's hanging over your head, when, when you're in a hurry and God's not? Uh, by the way, you, you probably know some people in your life that don't struggle with this. Uh, they walk very closely and intimately with Jesus and whatever's going on in their life, they're like, man, no problem. God's got this. I'm going to be good. And, and, and if you're like me, what you want to do is like, you don't want to trust them, right? <laughs> you're weird. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you get through this? Uh, I don't trust you. But what if? What if they remembered something we've forgotten? What if they're so focused in on something that, that we don't see anymore? Uh, what if they've, they've developed this, this whole new, new level that's available to you and me when it comes to trusting God? Uh, what do I need to remember? Uh, what do I need to do? So we jump into the story. We left Jesus as the little lamb from Bethlehem, uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And today I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2. Uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, if you brought a Bible with you, just becoming familiar with the Bible, have a mobile device. Luke chapter 2 is pretty easy to find. But in the Newer Testament, there are four accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they're the stories of his life. By the way, only, only two of them uh, give us, well, three of them, but two of them mainly give us uh, anything about Jesus' birth, Matthew and Luke. Uh, and John gives us one verse, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's John's whole account of the Nativity. Mark doesn't even talk about the birth of Jesus. We'll talk more about that in the days to come. But Luke chapter 2, uh, after Jesus, is when we're, we're going to jump in at uh, verse 21. Luke 2, 21. Uh, at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. I need you to look at this because I want to, first of all, I want us to look at Jesus' earthly parents, at, at Mary and his earthly father, Joseph. And I, and I need you to understand just at least seven times in Luke chapter 2 from verse 21 to the end of the chapter, at least seven times it tells us that, that Mary and Joseph were, were, were people who lived their life in accordance and in obedience to the word of God. What they would have said were Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah. They lived their lives in obedience to the word of God. They understood that they were given one task and one task only. It's a big one. Raise the son of God. There you go. While he's on planet earth, I'm putting him in your home. You raise him. And, and they had a decision. How are they going to raise him? And every parent that God has ever blessed with a child, has a decision. How are we going to raise our child? And, and, the, and the old saying is, uh, you, you know, children are born and they, they, they don't come with a manual. Uh, yes, they do. Here it is. Right here. This is how we're supposed to raise our children, according to the word of God. And Joseph and Mary were going to raise Jesus in accordance with the word of God. So day eight of Jesus' life, in accordance with the law, in accordance with tradition, uh, Jesus has to be circumcised. And so uh, they come, and it's time for him to be circumcised. And, and we want to zero in on that part. But no, we, I want to I show you what comes next. And when he was circumcised, he was called 
Jesus. On day eight, he got his earthly name. They knew Joseph and Mary both had been visited by an angel. They'd both been told, you will call his name Jesus. But they had a choice. They had free will. They could have named him whatever they wanted to name him. But I want you not to scoop past this. He was circumcised and he was called Jesus and probably a priest or a member from the local synagogue came to the place where they were and said, what do you call this child? By what name will you call this child? And I need you to see right here on day eight, Mary and Joseph were radically obedient to everything that God had said. Don't pass this by. The angel said it before she had conceived, so at least nine months ago, and it told them, you're going to name him Jesus, but they had a choice. The name means rescuer. The name means savior. The name means deliverer. Uh, In Hebrew, it's the name Joshua. Uh, For us who who understand, uh, think about the names of God, it's it's Yahweh saves. It's it's the one who rescues. It's the one who redeems. It's the one who delivers. And that's who you're going to call him because that's who he's going to be. And I just need you to grab a hold. This, I don't know, 13, 14, 15-year-old young girl and this, I don't know, 16, 17, 18-year-old young man in spite of all the odds, in spite of all the things that could have gone against them, they were radically obedient on the eighth day of Jesus' life. And they said, this is how we're going to live our life. Now, we're going to see in a couple of weeks, they weren't perfect earthly parents. In fact, when Jesus is 12, they lose him. Yeah, they lose him. They don't know where he's at. So they're not perfect, but they said, in our imperfection, we're going to do everything that God tells us to do, my friends. What an amazing example from a couple of teenagers. To the teenagers in the room, to the teenagers listening to me right now, God is speaking to you right now. You don't have to wait till you're an adult. God has things for you to hear. God has things for you to do. God has a desire for you to start being radically obedient to him now. And so many of us think, well, we'll do that later. But now's the time to begin to be radically obedient to God. So day eight, God's, God knew Mary and Joseph would be imperfect. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for direction. And they were just willing to walk in radical obedience. Uh, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Can you imagine wrestling with this decision? You know, we're going to call him Jesus. What are people going to say? How are people going to treat him? What are... How are And they knew what God wanted them to do. But when the time for obedience came, they said yes. What area of your life right now is God calling you to be obedient? And why are you putting him off? Eight days old. Now, in that culture, the woman, after she gives birth, according to the law, is is ceremonially unclean uh, for 40 days if she gives birth to a boy, 80 days if she gives birth to a girl. And I don't know if that means girls are harder to raise. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what the implication there is. I say that because I raised three daughters, and they were a joy at, at all times. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm serious. One of them sitting here today. And so, uh, um, but there's just this, there's just this, uh, so, so Mary can't go to the temple. Mary can't do anything. And so the next verse we see uh, in Luke chapter 2 says, uh, no, 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 go back. We'll come back. There. I evidently didn't include this. Verses 22 through 24 of, of Luke chapter 2 um, says this, And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, um, so eight days old, that means now Jesus is 40 days old because that's the first day Mary could go to the temple. Um, They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And they came to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Mary and Joseph come to the temple when Jesus is 40 days old to make a sacrifice. They come to offer an offering. The offering is referred to as the redemption of the firstborn son. 
That's the technical name of the offering, the redemption of the firstborn son. According to the law of Moses, every firstborn Jewish boy is set apart for God to become a priest. Every firstborn boy is set apart to become a priest. Now, now that's in the law. That, that doesn't go away. But you remember, maybe if you're familiar with the story, as, as God's people are enslaved in Egypt, they cry out to God, God hears their cry, he sees their misery, and he's concerned, and he sends them a rescuer and a deliverer named Moses who comes and is going to take the people of God out of Egypt uh, to the land of Israel, to the land of freedom, to the promised land. And, and as they journey, they come to a place to worship God at a mountain, and Moses goes up to the top of the mountain, he's going to receive the ten, what we call the Ten Commandments. And when he goes up and he receives the Ten Commandments, he comes back down and he finds a worship service going on. But it's not a worship service to God. It's a worship service to a golden calf. Remember? They're worshiping the golden calf. And Moses is mad and drops the tablets. And all these kind of things happen. And, and in that moment, of the 12 tribes of Israel, there are 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel, only one tribe is not involved in the worship of the golden calf. No one from the tribe of Levi is involved in the worship of the golden calf. So God says, from this moment on, I pick the Levites, all the males of the tribe of Levi, to be my priests. No longer the firstborn son of every tribe. Now, now I just want the, the, the sons from the tribe of Levi to be my priests because, because they didn't get involved in the worship of the golden calf. Those are the people I want serving in my temple. Those are the people I want serving in my sanctuary. Now... There's a problem. In the law, it's still required that the firstborn son of every Jewish tribe is a priest. So God institutes an offering, a sacrifice, where the parents of the firstborn male Jewish son outside the tribe of Levi on day 40 of his life come to the temple to buy him back come to the temple and they offer an offering. If they're rich enough, they offer a lamb or a goat. If they're uh, not so rich, they offer a pair of turtle doves, pigeons. And if they're even poorer, they offer a pancake that's made like wheat and uh, of grain and flour. And, and so this is what Mary and Joseph are coming to do. They're coming to the temple on day 40 of Jesus' life to buy him back. They will pay the offering. By the way, just as an aside, did you notice that Mary and Joseph's offering is a couple of turtle doves? It reminds us that Jesus was born into poverty. Uh, don't skip that. Because there are a lot of people that are going to tell you uh, that Jesus came only to make you rich on planet earth. Uh, Jesus was born into poverty. It didn't mean that, that the helpless and the marginalized and the hopeless that every society has with them were a cause that Jesus took. No, Jesus was one of them. And he understands with their hurt and their, and their pain. But, but Mary and Joseph come and they offer this offering. Now the redemption of the firstborn son. At the end of that offering, a priest is going to utter some words. The priest is going to say some words that the priest only says one other time a year. And the only other time during the year that the priest says these words are when uh, the Passover lambs are coming. You know, everybody at Passover comes and offer a sacrificial lamb. And when the last Passover lamb is killed on Passover, the priest utters these same words that he utters at the sacrifice or that the offering for the redemption of the firstborn son. Are you ready for the words? It is finished. It is is finished. Uh, do those words sound vaguely familiar to any of you who are familiar with the scripture? It, it's the words, some of the words that Jesus, <laughs> the last lamb that would ever need to be sacrificed, would utter as the last priest <laughs> that needed to give the offering. It is finished. And so we, we, we move through this part of the story, and if we're, if we're not careful, we, we miss the significance of everything that's, that's going on here. And so I, I just want you to, to understand that, that 
Mary and Joseph are coming to give an offering that's going to, by law, release Jesus from all of his priestly duties. But he voluntarily takes them back. He voluntarily, he's the only one that could do it, offers himself as the last lamb that will ever need to be sacrificed. All right, you're not fired up enough, so we'll just keep going. Um, Luke chapter 2, here's how this story continues. After they come, uh, day 40, uh, they come into the temple. They've come to buy, redeem, that's the word, to redeem Jesus uh, back. Uh, Verse 25 says, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. We don't know much about him. And Luke is really careful uh, to make sure um, we know more what he was like than who he is. And he lists some things about him. His name means the one who hears and obeys. Simeon just means the one who hears and obeys. Now, here's what it says about him. It says that he was righteous, which means he was right with God. The, the man who is righteous tries to preserve the, the peace and the prosperity of the community in which he lives. The man who is righteous is the one who, who is going to, to show mercy to the sinners and, and care for those who are marginalized. He, he's the one who's going to reach out to those who are in distress. He's the one who openly and outwardly lives his life. And people look at him and say, oh my goodness, uh, he, he lives his life according to the law. He lives his life. He loves God with all of his heart and he loves his neighbor like he loves himself. Uh, that's him. And Simeon was this, was this elderly man and he, he begins to... to to come to the temple uh, every day because God said something to him. The Holy Spirit has said something to him. He's righteous, but it also says he's devout. And and, and devout simply means he's obedient. It's not that he's reverent. That's how we look at devout. Oh, they're a devout person. They show up at church all the time. No, devout means obedient. He was obedient to the word of God. And the word of God that he had was, you will not see death until you see my Messiah. You will not see death. And so I think Simeon shows up uh, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit at the temple every single day. And can you imagine how many thousands of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of 40-day-old babies he's seen? All the parents coming to, to offer this sacrifice, to, to buy their firstborn baby boys back. And they're coming to offer the sacrifice, and he's seen thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of babies. But on this day, on this day, As Mary and Joseph, on the 40th day of Jesus' life, enter into the temple, the Holy Spirit of God whispers into Simeon's ear, that one there, him. And Simeon, in obedience, walks over to Mary and Joseph. And the picture is that he just pulls the baby out of Mary's arms. And he starts to sing. By the way, if if you're interested... um, I'm already thinking about next Christmas. Don't know for sure what we're going to do. Pastor Walter and I haven't talked about it. But Luke uh, lists the first four songs of Christmas. And, and Simeon's is song number four. And it's just this amazing song. Uh, he, he, he's righteous. He's devout. By the way, your righteousness doesn't get you closer to God. Uh, your righteousness is lived out because of a God who came close to you. He, he, he loves God. He fears God. To, to be devout means that he doesn't obey God um, out of ritual. He obeys God out of love. He, he just obeys God from his heart. He wants to love God. He wants to love people. And he takes this baby and he pulls her out, him out of uh, Mary's arms and, and he starts to sing. He starts to sing. And, and here's his song, I think. Is that next? Yeah, here's his song. And he came in the spirit in the temple, and when the parents brought the child, uh, brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, wow, and here's the song. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, for glory to your people Israel. Here's a man who's lived his life in obedience to God as a servant of God. And you know what he says? Okay, God, I'm ready for your final command. And God, I know the final command that you're ever going to give me is go die. It's time. Go die. 
And Simeon says, I'm ready. Now let it be according to your servant. Now, now, let it, uh, now uh, you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Uh, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Here's his song in three parts. He remembers. He rescues. He guides. He remembers. He rescues. He guides. Who listening to the sound of my voice right now needs that? Who needs that? I've got a hunch. Everyone. He remembers. He rescues. He guides. When there's this thing hanging over my head, when, when God isn't in a hurry but I am, there's something I need to remember. And the thing I need to remember is that he remembers. He remembers. Uh, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. Simeon grabbed a hold of a promise of God, and the promise of God to Simeon was, you will not die until you see my Messiah, until you see the one that I am sending, the rescuer and redeemer that your people have been waiting for for thousands and thousands of years, the one that you've been waiting for all of your life. You're not going to die. And Simeon, when the stuff was hanging over his head and he's getting older, he's like, I don't know how much longer I've got. And he could have been fearful that death was pursuing him and afraid that he was going to die, but he held on to the promise of God, my friend. What promise of God do you need to hold on to? I don't know the promise of God. Start reading his book because they're filled with all kinds of promises, all kinds of promises for who you are. And God wants us to live like Simeon, understanding that he remembers, he rescues, and he guides. You're in a hurry and God's not. He hasn't forgotten you. His time is perfect. He's never early. He's never late. He's always on time. He's going to rescue you. That's his promise. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm going to guide you from here to today. And, and his, his book says um, his word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. He's given us everything we need to take the next step on our journey of faith. We might not understand it all, but he's there. He, he, he rescues. He remembers. He rescues. He got, I, just, I just need to know are you willing to dig into this book this year and find the promise of God you've got something that's hanging over your head the only thing that's going to get you through it the only thing that's going to keep you from living in fear is if you come to understand a promise of God for the situation that you're in right now and you're probably not going to be able to figure it out on your own you're going to need some help start talking to some people who can help you Dig into the promises of God that you can hold on to. Because when you have that promise of God, you remember. He remembers. He rescues. He guides. When I wrestle with this chronic pain, and there are days that um, sometimes it's all I can do to get out of bed. And I beg God for 30 plus years to take this away. And he's said, not yet. Have you figured out, my friend, there's a difference between no and not yet? The answer ultimately might be no. I don't know. It may never go away. But I remember the promise of God. And the promise of God, whatever you're walking through, Tim, my grace is sufficient for you for today. So all you need for today is my grace. Uh, surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. That's what's chasing after me. Um, my friend, what, what do you need to remember? What promise? He remembers, he rescues, he guides. He remembers, he rescues, he guides. Luke chapter 2, verse 33 to 35. I need to keep going. And his father and mother marveled at what was being said about him. And Simeon blessed them. And I think Mary wishes it would have stopped there on day 40 of Jesus' life. He blessed God. He held this baby, he sang a song, and he blesses Mary and Joseph. And then he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And that verse right there is why I joke my least favorite Christmas song of all is Mary Did You Know as Mary knew Mary knew 
because God told her that her baby boy was going to die. Fast forward 30 some odd years. Jesus is hanging on a cross where he's going to utter it is finished. Uh, His mama is at the foot of the cross watching everything that took place. And I've got a hunch. I don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. But I bet her heart's breaking because her baby boy has just been beaten and bloody, humiliated, cursed, mocked. The baby boy that she held in her arms. This baby boy that on day eight she named Jesus because she knew. But on the cross, I think, Mary heard him say, it is finished. And maybe it all came together for her. Oh, I heard that on day 40 of his life. Wow, he really is the one. And Jesus, Simeon, Simeon teaches us how to wait. Waiting is active obedience in the thing that God has called you to do. Active obedience in the task assigned. Um, as a quote from G. Campbell Morgan next, I think, maybe. Let's see. Uh, uh, this One of my favorite preachers of all time uh, says this. Waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the ab- abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means, first, activity under command. Second, readiness for any new command that may come. And third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. Simeon, right there. I just keep showing up at the temple. I'm not going to bless any baby until you tell me he's the one. But I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep waiting. I'm not going to go to sleep. I'm not going to abandon all effort. I, I'm, I, I'm, just, I, I'm under your command. And Simeon, uh, he keeps going. He just remembers. He rescues. Uh, he remembers. He rescues. He guides. He remembers. He rescues. He guides. And when this thing's hanging over your head, when God's not in a hurry, but you are, sometimes just God calls you to wait. And if God calls you to wait, I just beg of you, think about Simeon, who was waiting for the consolation of Israel, for Jesus to do what only Jesus could come and do. But there's a second person that shows up in this story at the temple that day, and and her name is Anna. If Simeon shows up every day waiting, Anna shows up every day worshiping. Look, Look what's said about Anna. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. By the way, j- just so you know, because we want to talk about Anna, um, the tribe of Asher is one of the, the ten northern tribes of Israel. And when the northern tribes of Israel were to kind of destroyed in uh, 722 B.C. by Assyria, that th- those tribes kind of disappeared. People wonder what happened to them. Uh, and, and they've been marginalized. They've been forgotten. I just need you to understand that Anna comes from a long line of people who've been forgotten. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. I don't know. Jewish girls in that day got married 13, 14, 15, something like that. So for the sake of math, Let's just say she got uh, married at 17. Married for seven years when her husband dies. She's now a widow. And now she's 84. For 60 years, she lived her life as someone who had been forgotten. As a widow. She's at the temple. You know what that means? That means she didn't have a, her husband was dead and she didn't have any grown sons that agreed to take care of her. So now she was at the mercy of anybody who would come to the temple to take care of a widow. And not everybody did. You'll remember that in the Jesus movement, one one of the things that that is going to be said is going to be, you want to know what true and undefiled religion is? To care for orphans and widows in their distress. Because widows were outcasts. Widows were forgotten. Widows were marginalized. We don't have time for you, so you, you, you you just go over and you do your own thing. And so Anna is, she's forgotten. She's marginalized. But she, for 60 years of her life, look what it says, For 60 years of her life, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Night and day. She came to the temple. Night and day. Night and day. Night and day. 
Simeon has the luxury of the Holy Spirit of God whispering into his ear, go to the temple today, Jesus is going to be there. And here come thousands of baby boys to be uh, redeemed and bought back. And the Holy Spirit of God whispers into Simeon's ear, that one there, not Anna. You see how Anna heard the voice of God? Through daily discipline and devotion. She just showed up every day and worshiped God. She just showed up every day and worshiped God. Night and day, praying, fasting, night and day, praying, fasting, worshiping. Her discipline and her devotion over the course of her lifetime put her in the position to finally see Jesus. And some of you, when you're going through something and uh, God's not in a hurry, but you are, when something's hanging over your head, the first thing to go is, is you stop this daily devotion and this daily discipline. It's daily devotion, daily discipline. I've got a hunch that some of you have made a New Year's resolution to spend more time in God's Word, to spend more time with God, to spend more time praying, to spend more time uh, worshiping. Well, uh, I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm going to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, you're going to quit this Friday. Statistics show that two-thirds of all New Year's resolutions that are made end the second Friday after New Year's Day. It's known as Quitter's Day. Really, it's known as Quitter's Day. Oh, I made it through the first weekend. Oh, I, but but I, I, that, that new diet is the week. Oh, I'm just going to splurge this weekend. And you don't. Oh, I, 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 I'm going to go to church every Sunday. Uh, the first Sunday of the new year, I made it. Second, oh, I just uh, got something else I can do today. The second Friday after the New Year's, Quitter's Day. What do you need to remember? He remembers. What do you need to do? I want to share with you very quickly uh, some things that we need to do. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to imitate people of strong faith. I may have skipped a few slides, but if you can find that one for me. We need to imitate people of strong faith. We need to imitate uh, Mary and Joseph. We need to imitate Simeon and Anna. We need to imitate people of strong faith. Um, on, on these screens, we're just going to move through these quickly. What I want you to do, I'm just not going to talk about them much, but I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to ask you to read the scripture with me. So imitate people of strong faith. Now, can you go back, please? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, let's read together. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate inherit what had been promised, Simeon and Anna, <laughs> Mary and Joseph. They inherited what had been promised because they remembered, he remembered that he was going to promise them and he was going to be true to his promise. And so we need to imitate people of strong faith. What does that look like? Uh, what do I need to remember? I remember he remembers. What do I need to do? I need to keep on. I need to not quit. And so I just went through the scriptures in preparation for this and found a whole bunch of scriptures that, that talked about uh, things we need to keep on doing. So let's go to the first one. It says, uh, we need to keep on waiting. We need to keep on waiting. Uh, from Habakkuk chapter 2, if you can, if you can see that, let's, let's read that together. At the time I have decided, my words will come true. You can trust what I say about the future. It may take a long time, but keep on waiting. It will happen. And Simeon, keep on waiting, and he shows up. Anna, keep on waiting. And she shows up because God had promised. They remembered that he remembers. They kept on waiting. They kept on waiting. So where do you need to keep on waiting? Uh, remember, it's not laziness. It's not doing nothing. It's, it's, it's trusting God and his promise. Uh, keep on waiting. Uh, secondly, uh, let's keep on worshiping. Keep on worshiping. I think that's next. Yeah, uh, look what uh, Philippians 4 9 says. Let's read it together. Keep on putting into practice all you learned from me and heard from me and saw me doing. What do we see Anna doing? We saw her worshiping day and night, never left the temple day and night, never left her praying, fasting, praying, fasting. Uh, she kept on worshiping. We need to keep on worshiping. Uh, the author of Hebrews is going to say to us, uh, don't uh, forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. We need to worship together. We need to, to do that. I, I want you as much as you can in uh, this next two-year run in the life of Miami Valley Church to commit to, to being here and bringing somebody with you. And if you can't be here, to watching online, to, to just worship God together. Uh, third, let's just keep on praying. Keep on praying. Uh, keep on asking. Let's read together. Keep on asking, and you will be given what you ask for. Keep on looking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open. We need to keep on praying. We need to keep on praying. In the midst of, of you being in a hurry and God not, and God's not answering something the way you want it to be answered, keep on praying, my friend. You better believe that, that every day, until God tells me absolutely not, that I'm not taking this pain away, I, I beg God every day to take my pain away. And I keep on asking, and I keep on looking, and I keep on knocking, because it's what God wants us. He's not in a hurry. 
to change this for me. And that's got to be okay with me. But it doesn't mean I stop asking until he tells me don't ask anymore. If he tells me stop asking because he's going to say, uh, Paul's going to say on one occasion that, that he prayed three times for God to do something and God said consistently, no, I'm not going to do it. And so Paul stopped asking. But until that point, I'm going to hold on to the promises of God and I'm going to keep on asking. We keep on praying. We keep on praying. We keep on praying. Next, uh, we keep on serving. Never be lazy in your work, but keep on serving the Lord enthusiastically. Some of you are going to say, hey, this year at Miami Valley Church, I'm going to serve and I'm going to, I'm going to serve you know, one Sunday a month. I'm going to serve two Sundays a month. I'm going to serve three Sundays a month. And, and by National Quitters Day, you're going to give up and like, ah, I'm going to phone off. I'm just not going to do that anymore. And God says we need to serve. And so, uh, and, and uh, please understand, this is for everybody that's listening, and I'll tie this together in a second. Uh, let's keep going real quick. Keep on serving. Uh, keep on going to small group, and I need to hit timeout. Some of you need to start going to small group. My friend, my heart is breaking for the amount of pain that exists in our church family right now. My heart's breaking. I'm going to talk with you more about, Pastor Jed and I are going to talk with you more about this next week. And one of the things that causes my heart to break is that so many that are hurting have no one to share it with. Friends, it's the friendships you develop when nothing's going wrong that are going to sustain you when everything's going wrong. Keep on going to small group. Hebrews 10. Let's read together. Don't give up your habit of meeting with other believers. Instead, keep on encouraging one another. Some of you are like, I'm doing that on Sunday morning. You know, really on Sunday morning, you're not meeting so much with other believers. I, I watch. You come in. Some of you come in three minutes before we start and check out about ten minutes before I'm done. But you don't leave. Thank you very much until about ten minutes after. But, but, but it's, it's in the context of small group where you're going to learn how to encourage one another. We're going to find a group of people. Keep on going to small group. Uh, next, keep on sharing and showing the love of Jesus. This year, keep on sharing and showing the love of Jesus. Uh, let's read together from Ecclesiastes. Keep on sowing your seed. Where you never know which ones will grow, perhaps they all will. Keep on sharing and showing the love of Jesus. Next, keep on believing. Keep on believing. Would you read this from 2 Timothy with me? Let's read it together. You must keep on believing the things you have been taught. You know that they are true. He remembers. He rescues. He guides. Keep on believing because it's true. Keep on believing. Keep on believing. And then finally, keep on trusting. Keep on trusting. Read it with me if you would please. Even when I am afraid, I keep on trusting you because fear is really not the things that's chasing you. The thing that's chasing you is the love of Jesus who came and said, it's finished. I remember. I rescue. I guide. Here's the last thing I want to say to you this morning. Luke, in his account, he, he, he's a doctor, but he's a historian. Uh, he's also, the, also the, we believe, the author of the book of Acts. He wants to tell us the, 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 the logical and the, the, the chronological kind of story of Jesus. Uh, but he's also the one that includes the four songs of Christmas. But I don't want you to miss this. In Luke's account of the nativity, in Luke's account of the nativity in the first 40 days of Jesus' life, he does something spectacular in my opinion. He offers something for everyone to latch on to. He tells the story of the birth of Jesus, and he starts with the birth of John the baptizer to an elderly couple who'd lost all hope of ever being able to have a baby of their own, God does the miraculous and says to that elderly couple, I'm not done with you yet. To a couple of teenagers. That, that's song one. Song two is the angels. To the shepherds, to the people who are marginalized, to the outcasts, to those who, whose testimonies aren't trusted, hey, I'm going to use people like you. And there's a song. Song three is Mary's song. A couple of teenagers who hear the Holy Spirit, who hear from angels, who hear from God. I have big plans for you. I'm going to use you. And they're radically obedient. Song three. 
Song four. Simeon's song. Simeon and Anna. Anna's 84. How old Simeon? Maybe the same age, maybe close, maybe older, but, but, but he's there. I just love this. And I think this is the word for our community of faith today. Wherever you're at, in your age, teenagers, 80-somethings, God's not done with you yet. Don't quit. Our church needs you to wait and worship, to pray, to serve, to give, like you've never prayed, served, and given before. There's something for everybody to latch on to, and something for everyone to hold on to. And the thing that we most ultimately need to hold on to is what Jesus has done for us. Father, I just thank you right now in this moment that uh, you have spoken to everyone regardless of their age that you have a word for each of us. We're not too young, nor are we too old. That there's no time for any of us just to sit. Father, for the young people that are listening, I I just pray that this would be the kind of church where they never feel like they just have to sit and wait their turn, but that they understand that they're fully functioning members of of this church family and, and, and your kingdom. They have gifts and they have a call and God, you're speaking to them. Give us us wisdom and encouragement to to encourage them. God, they they have dreams and they have desires and they have just uh, just this this understanding of what radical obedience might look like. God, uh, help us to draw from their energy. Father, I pray for those that find themselves uh, at the later stages of life. God, I I pray that you'd encourage them not to quit. May we as a congregation, uh, may I as a pastor understand how to draw from their uh, faithful obedience year after year after year to seek counsel. God, may they they never come to the conclusion, well, what we'll we'll put our time in now is just time for us to to sit and, and let others serve. God, may... May all of us, regardless of our age, regardless of our condition, may may we all just say, God, we want to follow hard after Jesus. Father, for the one today who's never seen before that Jesus remembers, that he rescues, and that he guides, God, I, I pray today that they would surrender their life to him, that they'd see that he came, and from the very moment of his birth, mother and father out of obedience to your word offered him and he was the one who would become the savior of the world. Father, today we celebrate his name, Jesus. God, for the one who just needs to call on him and surrender to them, may they have the boldness to pray for God. I I don't understand it all, but come into my life. Uh, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. Father, for the ones that have done that, may we we wait as we worship. May we remember that you remember. And may we keep on doing the things you've called us to do this new year. May we not quit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you've made a decision, you can fill that out on the back of your card. You can put it in one of the red bowls. If you're new to the church, if you've made a decision to accept Jesus as your Savior today, if this is your first time, uh, Jake Robinson will be down front. He'd love to talk with you. He'd love to do that. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, there'll be some of us hanging around. Uh, We'd love to pray with you and help you take your next step on your spiritual journey. A couple things, just very quickly, uh, before I dismiss you. Uh, One, next weekend, uh, do everything you can to be here. Uh, Do everything you can, if you're not here, to watch online. Pastor Wooldridge and I are going to be sharing uh, a a sermon on vision for our church uh, for 2019 and 2020. Uh, We really think it's going to be a very important day in the life of our church, so we want you to be here uh, next Sunday, however you can. And then secondly, I just want to say, Thank you to those of you who have given to the end of the year offering. Uh, as of today, the first Sunday of January, uh, we are over uh, 75% towards our goal. So the goal was $40,000. We're well over 75%. And so thank you to those of you who have given. Uh, just so you know, uh, gifts have ranged anywhere from the smallest gift of about $10 to on Christmas. Uh, there was a gift given uh, in one of the 
offering bowls and it was just a Christmas card and inside of it was $5,000 cash by an anonymous giver. And so uh, just people committed to the life and it's not about uh, uh, equal gifts, it's about equal sacrifice. And so just thank you. Some of you in the years past have said, hey, could you extend the offering through January because I get my bonus in January, I get those kind of things. And so you can continue to give uh, to the end of the year, start of the year offering uh, through the end of January. You can do it with the green envelopes that are provided. You can do it online. Just make sure you hit that and it allows us uh, to get ready to share and show the love of Jesus across the Miami Valley because in case you didn't know it, it's only 105 days till Easter. All right, just, just, just say it's only 105 days till Easter when people are going to be excited to come back to the things of God. Would you stand with me for a word of blessing and benediction? Father, my simple prayer this day is Jesus Christ. Make us more like you so that we can be less of what we used to be and more of what we ought to be. More like you. Father, may your provision and your protection rest on these, and may they remember that you remember. And may they seek you as the one who remembers, who rescues, and who guides. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. See you next week.